Hey, everybody, this is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Grant Sega. You'll probably all notice that there's a little similarity there in the last name. Grant is my son, and Grant is the vice president and co-owner of Spring Creek Manufacturing. Welcome, Grant. Yes, thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. We're very excited to hear the story of what you have done with Spring Creek. And uh, the story is going to be quite compelling, and it's it's very fun story. But before we get to that, Grant, let's talk about you a little bit here. And first, tell our listeners, where did you grow up and what did your childhood look like? Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in Hermantown, Minnesota. So for those of you who don't know northern Minnesota, it's uh, I'd say about a five to 10 minutes um, from Duluth, a small little town, I guess, uh, from, you know, Duluth standards, it's a small town, it's about 9000 people population. And um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's one of those places that I think, you know, your neighbors, you know, um, everybody, you go to a store and you see people that, that, you know, you, you can strike up conversations with at the grocery store or the gas station or what have you. And, um, my childhood was, was a really good one. Um, I actually, um, as you know, being my dad, I'm, uh, quite the energetic person. And I think I was always, um, getting into different activities, whether it was sports, whether it was, um, being outdoors, hiking, I was kind of bouncing off the walls and, um, so it was, uh, yeah, I couldn't ask for a better childhood. So you obviously got some of my genes there if you were uh, bouncing off the walls. So what kind of sports, Grant? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. What kind of sports were you in and what kind of activities did you do growing up? Yeah. So, um, from the sports perspective, I, I probably tried just about everything under the sun. I, I mean, I played soccer, football, hockey, I played basketball, I ran track, but from other activities outside, I mean, um, I was, I'm really an outdoors person, uh, kind of to my core. I think I get that just from, you know, generations of my, my uncles, my grandfather, uh, you as my dad. And, um, you know, so I, I like to spend a lot of time outside, whether that's hunting, whether that's fishing, um, just being, you know, in the outdoors, taking the dog for a walk. Um, and then obviously all the water sports activities as well, being in a canoe, um, being out in the boundary waters and, and camping and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I think my, my favorite place to be is absolutely outside. Um, I know in, in uh, the winter months in northern Minnesota that uh, we get a little bit holed up uh, for, for some of the months. But, um, you know, with, with kind of being in, in the Duluth area, there's a lot of winter activities that you can do outside as well. But, um, yeah, a lot of outside activities and, and staying active as much as possible. Grant, where, where did you go to school and what did you major in? So I went to school at the University of Wisconsin-Superior. Um, and I ended up going there for, uh, my major was business administration with a management concentration. Um, so I got to do all the different economics classes, accounting classes. But then as I got into uh, my last couple of years of school, there were a lot of uh, more management specific uh, type courses that I was taking. So that was my, my major and, and uh, I, I finished up there. Uh, let's see here, it would have been the spring of 2017. Um, so it was, uh, it, it's been a couple of years now. I can't believe it's already been, what has it been five years now about since or coming up on five years, I guess this spring, since I, uh, finished up college and, uh, time flies, that's for sure. So what were your initial plans, uh, after getting out of college, uh, before maybe, uh, old dad threw a monkey wrench in the program? Yeah. Um, <laughs> get a job. I think that was first and foremost. What it was is I wasn't really sure. Uh, do something with obviously what my my major was involved with and uh, being business, it's a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad major to, to go into. So there's all these different parallels that you could get, get a job in with the business side of things. But it was, uh, plan was just initially get a job, start working, start making money, um, and, and then the, the spring Creek conversations that, that we started, which we'll probably touch on a little bit later here, that, that sort of just fell out of the sky and fell into both of our laps. And we had discussions about that, which, like I said, I'm sure we'll talk about, but, um, yeah, it was just 
real, really just to circle back, the initial plans were just get a job, start working and making some money. Well, let's talk about Spring Creek then. Yeah, what a perfect segue into it, Grant. Uh, how did that whole conversation come about and how did you get involved? Yeah, so um, basically how, how we got involved with Spring Creek was um, it kind of goes back to the kind of the roots of the being an outdoor family and being an outdoors person myself. And um, we had an idea or, or uh, you and I had an idea that was to build a camping saw. I can say that now because we've launched that product, but a camping saw. Um, and, you know, people that are, are in the outdoors, they know there, you know, there's a lot of different camping saws out there, but we wanted to pull from different saws that, you know, things that we liked about certain ones, some things that we didn't like about certain saws and get those fixed or, or adjusted as you will. Um, and, and so we had an idea to make this saw. And so we brought it to a manufacturing facility. Uh, we have actually uh, a, a shack that we go to in, uh, in Northern Minnesota. And as we were up there one day, we were having a conversation. Hey, let's look for some different manufacturing, some aluminum fabrication facilities that we could get this saw made to. And um, we ended up coming across Spring Creek and it was not too far from where we uh, have have our, our place up north. And it was like, hey, let's stop in there and have a conversation with these people and um, ended up getting introduced to the Newberg family who were the owners at the time of what was Spring Creek Outfitters and talked to them about the idea of, of this camping saw that we uh, thought to to you know have have made here and um, that kind of started the conversations back and forth if I remember correctly that wasn't the initial converse or the initial conversation wasn't really um, the conversation that involved us with with getting involved with Spring Creek outside of just the saw um, but we we that kind of was the opening of the dialogue so to speak and um, then I believe it was a year or two later, we ran into the Newbergs down at the uh, sports show down at the deck, the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center down in Duluth. Um, and they were down there and um, they, they expressed to us that the business wasn't going so well and so that they could most likely do the, the saw, um, get the saw made for us and but it wouldn't necessarily be around for very long, uh, because business was struggling and uh, they pitched the question is, hey, why don't uh, why don't you guys think about buying Spring Creek and then we can just make the saws then. So um, that kind of started the conversations, got the ball rolling. Um, I believe that would have been maybe around the winter of 2016 into 2017. And that, like I said, that got the ball rolling. We stopped up and, and, you know, had a little bit more of a formal conversation with them. And you and I had multiple conversations about, you know, is this something that, um, that first of all, I wanted to do right out of school and that we want to do getting involved with the family or getting involved with your family in a business uh, together. And we had many of those conversations back and forth, if you remember that. And, um, you know, that kind of led us to closing on Spring Creek and, uh, in July, July 1st of 2017 is when we officially took over. So um, that uh, kind of a cool experience how it came about. I know I'm getting a little long winded here, but uh, cool, cool how it started just by, hey, this is an idea that we wanted to, um, you know, get a saw made. And next thing you know, it turned into a career for, for me and another business venture for you. And uh, cool part about that whole story is uh, we have since launched what we call our tough camp saw and uh, non-biased. It is the best camping saw folding, collapsing camping saw on the market bar none. Um, because to be honest with you, it came from the uh, different aspects of, Hey, we've tried this. We like this about this saw. Don't like this about this saw. How can we change that to make that better and still keep those those features of of what we really liked so um yeah it's it's kind of a neat story how it started but that's how my involvement started and now here we are in uh 2022 and it's coming up on five years i i can't believe it's been that long it just it blows me away it seems like it was yesterday that we originally had the conversations and we originally had the idea of the tough camp saw and i can tell you that grant said uh not being biased. I guess I will be a little biased, folks. Uh, it is hands down. I've been, I'm getting quite old. I've been in the outdoors a long, long time. I've used a lot of saws or I've, I've busted up my knuckles. And this saw uh, is, the word they would say is the bomb. It is a, a great saw and it's very lightweight and packable. 
and you can cut some nice sized wood with it if you're an outdoors person and a camper. So tell us the background story about Ted Newberg, the founding of Spring Creek, the year, what they kind of made first, and then bring us forward up to the point where you took the company over. Yeah, absolutely. So the company was founded by a gentleman by the name of Ted Newberg. Um, one thing that not a lot of people know, Ted was a science high school science teacher in uh, Mountain Iron, um, and he was an outdoors person to his core, hiking, camping. But he his his love was was the Boundary Waters and being on on the water and paddling, and and um, so he actually. Uh, he was always having a heck of a time portaging canoes. And, and I've actually heard this from his wife, Videtta, uh, from multiple conversations that uh, he was a slender shouldered man. And he would always talk about how he was would have the, uh, a literally and a figurative pain in his neck uh, to portage canoes because he was just having a heck of a time. So he was like, you know, there's got to be some some way that we can do this better and so he along with uh some of his family members his son chuck um it came up with the idea of what is now our canoe seat yoke and through multiple different iterations of it it started from talking to chuck it started in like the early 80s of trying different ideas and trying to figure out what worked and essentially what the the product is it's like i said our canoe seat yoke it's a tandem seat and a portage yoke, and it's the most comfortable one that you will ever use. And so he started, made one for himself, made one for his family, um, to where they were just going to use it for themselves. And then on different trips with his friends, hey, that thing's real great. I'd, I'd like to take, you know, try one of those out. Can you make one of those for me? And sure, we'll make one for you. And and it kind of just uh, rolled and rolled until there was people saying, hey, I'd like to buy one of those from you. Can I get one of those from you? And, and then that brought us to um, 1985 when they started the company Spring Creek Outfitters, and it was founded upon the canoe seat yoke. Um, and, and through multiple different uh, years from there, different ideas from customer base, and, and uh, it was kind of grown to where it is now. And, and the, the biggest thing of, of all of it was we wanted to T excuse me, Ted wanted to make sure that um, it was quality above all else. And it was a simple, simple things to use. And then it was always just different ways to portage, propel, launch and carry and haul canoes and kayaks and, and make it a lot easier and, and more simplistic for people to do. And so that was in 1985 is when the company first started. Um, and it's just grown to where it is now today with the different product lines. There's a background story somewhere because I know this was a real pain in Ted's neck about football shoulder pads. Yes. So as I mentioned, Ted was a high school science teacher. And because of his slender shoulder frame that, like I said, his wife Vi Videtta had told me, um, he used to take old, I guess you retired football pads that were no longer in, in use with the high school football team at Mountain Iron. And he would bring those with him on camping and canoeing trips so that he could wear those when he portaged his canoes. And that was kind of the, the start of, okay, this, there's gotta be a better way than, than me taking a set of old used high school football pads and bring them with me when I'm portaging these canoes. And, um, and so that's what, you know, generated the thought with the, the canoe seat yoke. And one thing with the canoe seat yoke, for those who aren't familiar with it is it's, it's an entire, if you picture like a standard canoe yoke bar, thwart bar, it's, you know, the kind of stretches across it from gunnel to gunnel of a canoe uh, might have a little bit of an angle on it to where you're neck can kind of slide in between it and then it's just got standard like rectangular pads well um you know from my experience using it as well the biggest gripe that a lot of people tend to have is gosh that bar just jabs you right in the back of the neck you can never really get a comfortable position on your shoulders that you know puts a pressure too close to your neck or it's too far away from your neck and with our canoe seat yoke it's it's actually like a barless design um so you don't have any pressure points on the back side of your neck um, and you can, you can adjust the pads. So for people who have different shoulder width, whether a little bit more slender shoulder, broad shouldered, anything in between, um, you can adjust the pads to where they, they sit and rest comfortable on, on your shoulders. And, and they really take the, uh, strain of the, of the boat weight away from those pressure points that a lot of traditional bars used to do. So Grant, let's fast forward now. So the Newbergs have the business. You come in, you take over the business as the operating partner of the business, and it's a family business. 
tell us a little bit about your experiences working with me and yeah. in a family business. And hey, be nice here. Yeah, I'll try my best. I'll have to bite my tongue. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, I think for me, the biggest thing in working with with family from from the standpoint of it is there's 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 a trust factor involved where you know that the decisions being made is is got the best interest of of the company in mind um, first and foremost, but then also um, just being able to be upfront and honest uh, with each other. And I think there's a certain bluntness that goes in in with that as well, um, which you know I think having conversations ahead of time, you know, there's no hard feelings. If if somebody thinks that somebody else's idea isn't the greatest you go ahead and tell them and that's fine, you know, because no harm done. Uh, you, you know, that both people, uh, um, have the, the best interest in mind, uh, of the company. So, um, I, I think just the communication standpoint, uh, I really enjoy that. Um, the trust factor, like I said, I, I really enjoy that. And then just being able to, um, have to have something that you can bond upon, I guess, um, you know, being from a, a a person that grew up in, in a family that was involved with business. Um, it, it's kind of been ingrained uh, in my day-to-day -day life since I was a kid. And uh, so I've kind of grown up around it. And so being able to, to be kind of involved in maybe those conversations that I would hear around the house as a kid to now being able to apply them to everyday life and professional life. And uh, so I've really enjoyed that. That's for sure. So a question for you, Grant, uh, a lot of people may think that being in a family business, that it's kind of a cakewalk for the family members to uh, to be in the business. What's what's the reality of that story? Yeah, of course, that's the perception from the outside always. But no, it's not. Uh, it's not that it's all not. It's not all sunshines and rainbows, uh, I guess, is, is a good good way to say it. You know, there's there's some uh, kind of let's see here. What's, what's the good uh, word I'm looking for. There's a, there's a certain level of expectation that's put on, um, which I think that's a good thing. I'm not saying that that is a, a, a bad thing by any means, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you, you, you go home and, and I think you have to make sure you draw a line between work and home. And um, I know you and I had those conversations early on that I touched on, um, you know, when you're home, you're home. When you're at work, you're at work. Uh, I, I know people probably kind of get a puzzled look on their face when I talk when talking about you were telling a story, and I will say, oh Tom, I was talking to Tom uh, when they're used to me saying dad, but when you know we're at work, you're Tom, and when we're at home, you're dad, and um, so you know it's it's I think something that you definitely have to draw a line in the sand, and and um, there's there's no hard feelings like I said uh, when it comes to um, you know if there's disagreements or or you know ideas that that don't match up, um, you know you just kind of trust each other that that you have the best interest in mind and and uh, go from there. Grant, what are your responsibilities as a partner and as the vice president, frankly, doing all of the heavy lifting uh, at a company in a manufacturing company? Yeah, so Spring Creek, um, Spring Creek is a small business. So I'll start that right out front. And um, so everybody, myself, uh, and, and everybody involved with Spring Creek um, is they wear a lot of hats day to day. Um, that's, that's, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, not everybody just has one isolated job. So um, although I am, uh, you know, in, uh, in the lead here and in charge of, of, uh, kind of uh, taking control of of Spring Creek. Um, I think there's there's no job that that somebody sh that I shouldn't be able to do, um, nor you know anybody else involved uh, that's working at Spring Creek. Um, and so from the standpoint of that, I mean, I there's days where on a day to day where I'll, I'll come in and um, you know it's it's often said not every day is the same. You don't, you don't go in assuming that it's you know you've got things in line. But I think from a day to day standpoint, you know I do a lot of overseeing day to day activities, whether that's purchasing um, and and making sure that we have materials so that we can get products made um, to dealing with customers direct, either business to business customers or just uh, general consumer customers. Um, 
but then just making sure that the scheduling's proper for production. Uh, but then you, you know, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be surprised, surprised to walk in one day to Spring Creek and, and see me back on a mill or a deburring machine or a drill press, because, um, you know, I want to get my hands dirty and work in production as well. And, um, even if we need a hand, if we have big orders going out and we need an extra hand in distribution, I'm, I'm there to lend a hand as well. So, um, day to day, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, changes from day to day, so to speak, but, um, it's, it's, I enjoy it. I enjoy going to work every day and I wouldn't change it for anything. You know, now five years in, you know, what you, you walk into for the most part every day, but five years ago, you were 22 years old, fresh out of school, going into a company that wasn't going to survive and you're tasked with turning it around. Can you explain some of the challenges at that time? First of all, not having the experience. And second of all, um, you know, you're in a turnaround situation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, I think it definitely, I guess, to circle back to the family business aspect, um, that helped a lot being uh, wide-eyed, young, first first job out of college. And and all of a sudden now I'm, I'm sitting here and, and tasked with, turning this business around. And um, so I think I, I would say a lot of the success or, or a lot of, of, you know, helping has been, uh, would be a testament to you. I would say you could probably uh, speak to, uh, I probably would have daily, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't odd for me to have 20 phone calls to you in a single day, those first couple months. And, um, you know, whenever I had questions, uh, you were always there to, to help answer those. And um, so, you know, I think just, Coming in, first and foremost, it was just, I wanted to get an idea of every aspect of the business. Um, that was probably the most challenging um, is, is to, to try and learn on the fly while it's, hey, you know, this, this situation we were in, the, the business wasn't doing well. We have to plug, a, you know, plug a lot of holes uh, fairly quickly, but I also have to learn about the business so that when I'm plugging these holes, I'm not plugging it with uh, the wrong sized uh, plug, I guess, so to speak. And um, so again, uh, it was it was just making sure that I was well-rounded. I think that was uh, probably the most difficult task um, was just getting fluent in all aspects on the fly and having to do so in a fairly quick manner. But um, it was, you know, there was a lot of long, long days and, and a lot of hours, some, some days where, um, you know, I would, I would get to the shop early and I wouldn't leave until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, drive home, turn around, come right back. Um, so, but you know what, it's, uh, it's one of those things, like I said, I wouldn't change it for anything. I learned a heck of a lot. Um, this is no disrespect to school uh, or college by any means. So anyone who's in school or any any professor listening, this isn't a slight by any means, but I learned more in uh, two, two to three months of actually applying business principles and being in business uh, than I did in all of my years of college. Again, that's not a that's not a slight by any means, but you can't you can't teach somebody the things that you learn in in you know, real life working. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the first time you have a, uh, maybe an unhappy disgruntled customer, you can't, you can't practice that, uh, in a classroom setting. And I think a lot of people in business would, would be able to, uh, kind of relate to me on that. So, um, but, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's been enjoyment. And, and like we've talked to mentioned multiple times already, I can't believe it's already been five years, but, um, it's been, it's been a pleasure every, every single day. What, what do you get the most enjoyment out of when when you're at Spring Creek or working at Spring Creek? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different things. I think first and foremost, being able to produce a quality product in the United States and knowing that it's getting in the hands of of people and they're getting to enjoy the um, fruits of our hard work and labor and being able to actually see, um, you know, th this product or use this product uh, firsthand and then get enjoyment out of it. I think probably my single most favorite thing is when we get customers that'll call us and say, Hey, I've had product X, Y, Z. I bought it on this date. I've used it for five years. I've used it for five months. I've used it for 20 years. Um, 
whatever. And they've, they've always have a story, whether it was, you know, a family trip or a time out in the woods or, you know, anything I, I could talk about it till I'm blue in the face. But I, I think that is my single most rewarding um, thing is when, when you hear a testimony from products or from customers, excuse me, of your products um, and, and that they're enjoying them because then you know that, that all of your hard work day to day is, is really, uh, it makes it feel uh, that much more worthwhile. Grant, what Spring Creek's products, you have two different verticals, and I'm sure you'll get into this. One is your paddle yep. sports, and one is your industrial truck racks. What separates your products at Spring Creek Manufacturing from your competitors in these verticals? Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, quality. Uh, something that we say every day, uh, we manufacture the highest of quality products um, out of the highest quality materials. And we are uh, not bashful in saying that. And also it's uh, our products made right here in the United States. Um, and we are, we are extremely proud of that. Um, and, and we stand behind the, the products that we do manufacture. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we, you know, from the standpoint of of customers reaching out to us and saying, Hey, you know what? Um, I had one of these parts and, and I lost it. Can I replace it? Is that possible? Yes, we can do that for you. And so from the standpoint of separating, uh, separating ourselves from our competitors is, is I think the quality of our products first and foremost, and the made in the United States. Um, and in a lot of our products, they are pretty uh, unique. Uh, touch back to the canoe seat yoke. Um, it's, it's, I, I've never seen anything like it on the market. Um, and then to other products that, that we manufacture that maybe you do see things on the market, like our truck rack line. Um, it's, we try to make them as number one user-friendly, but we try to, to separate ourselves by, you know, for example, with our truck racks, um, they adjust up and down and in and out, and they're entirely made out of anodized aluminum and stainless steel fasteners. And why I highlight that is anodized aluminum will not rust, it will not rot, and stainless steel also will not rust and will not rot. So although there might be other truck racks out there that are truck racks, um, ours do not rust, do not rot, and they're not make model year specific to trucks. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story here on, on, you know, kind of where that falls into play. We had a gentleman that, that uh, stopped into our shop actually. Um, and he brought a truck rack and I actually talked to him on the phone ahead of time. He goes, Oh yeah, I've had this truck rack that I, I bought a couple years ago. And, and uh, I, I just bought a new pickup truck and I want to be able to swap it onto the truck. And we said, absolutely. We can do that for you. And he came into our shop and he, he brought the rack in and, and, and I almost swallowed my tongue laughing. And because he said a couple years and uh, he, he had originally bought the rack in 1990 and this was this this last winter. Um, so you're talking 2021 into 2022 when he bought it in 1990. I think that's a little bit more in a couple of years. But the gentleman told me the story. He actually bought the rack. Um, and I will say the reason why he said a couple of years is because, oh, I thought it looked brand new. And, and I'm not just saying that. He said that to me. And so he actually had bought it originally. I believe it was for a Ford pickup truck back in, the, in 1990. And then I'd say in like mid to, to late 1990s, he put it onto a Chevy pickup truck, bought a new one of those. He just swapped it, made a couple adjustments to, to account for the, the box width or the cab height adjustment on that vehicle. And so he swapped that onto there. Then mid 2000s. Got another pickup truck, uh, took the rack off of his old truck, put it on the new truck, and then now he just bought another pickup truck. Um, and if I remember correctly, he put it on a Dodge. And so it went from a Ford to a Chevy to a Dodge pickup truck, same rack. All he had to do is make a couple tweaks, a couple adjustments. And I'm telling you, besides the fact that I knew we had changed a couple things from a model standpoint of it, the, the parts themselves look darn near brand new. And so it was, you know, I think that, that, quality speaks for itself. And that's something that we're proud to say, and that we really feel is, is what, you know, makes Spring Creek the highest quality product and separates ourselves. Greg, can you give us an idea of, of what your product line lineup looks like? Yeah. So like you had mentioned, we have two different uh, lines, as you will. We have what we call our paddle sports and camping line, uh, which is more of what the product, the, the company was, was originally founded upon. But then we've also um, started opening a line with our industrial truck, truck rack line uh, to service different contractors and construction uh, vehicles in their, in their you know, truck van and, and vehicle fleet. Um, and so in those different lines, I'll talk about our paddle sports line here specific. We make um, 
the camping saws that I mentioned are tough camp saws. So that's for the camping and paddle sports line. Uh, we, we make the canoe seat yokes in a product that we call a drop in, drop in canoe seat. It's a center seat, a third seat, an additional seat that's fully adjustable. You can put it on multiple different makes models, canoes, and you can adjust it so that, you know, different widths and things. Uh, we, we sell stabilizer floats that, that is, we're actually the original stabilizer float manufacturer. Others may claim that and they are incorrect. We are the original stabilizer float float manufacturer and proudly here in the United States. And um, our stabilizer floats, they, they go on canoes, they go on kayaks. We have them for John boats. We have them for sup boards. Uh, we have people that buy them. Believe it or not, I didn't know this. People do yoga on sup boards and they use their stabilizer floats to give them a little bit more balance when they're doing yoga out on the water. And uh, I had never heard that. Somebody was telling me that, that a customer was using it for that. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So um, our stabilizer floats are a huge, uh, huge part of our paddle sports line. Um, but then we also do have, like I said, into our uh, industrial truck racks, we have the standard truck racks, bed racks that would go on any standard pickup truck. We have cab racks or topper racks, which is what we call our suction cup rack. We have two different styles of hitch rack. We then have our headache style rack, which for those who aren't familiar with headache racks, they're like a, a rear window protecting rack that you can mount strobe lights on, or you can mount shovels to five gallon buckets, different things like that. And we make accessories for all those mounting to the full on cantilever racks that you know will telescope out over the top of the cab of the vehicle all the way to the back of the truck um we even have a design that actually has a swing open back crossbar gate so those who load different pallets tall pallets or different loads with fork trucks you can just load it right on back in there you don't have to worry about keeping it under the crossbar and then you can just shut that when you're done so um multiple different products uh we have motor mounts for canoes i mean i could go on all day here but um for those who are, are looking into it i'd check us out on the website springcreek.com if you have any questions on on products and that that we have you'll find them on the website while you're at it, give us your other handles for for social media. Yes, so uh, we are on Instagram and Facebook, Spring Creek MFG, um, and then, like I said, on our website, uh, www.springcreek.com, and you can you can check us out on the web and, and shop there. Folks, our special guest today is Grant Sega, Vice President and Partner in Spring Creek Manufacturing, a really cool, small, made-in-America company. And as I say on all of our podcasts, support American-made companies. These companies matter. They employ your neighbors, and they source their materials in the United States. It's very important that people support these companies. Grant, let's talk about your distribution strategy business to business, business to compute to co consumer, easy for me to say. Uh, how do you handle those channels? Yes. So um, as I mentioned, we, we have our uh, e-com website, springcreek.com. We sell on there. Uh, we also do have, we work with some rep groups um, that, that uh, you can find our products at and we do B2B. So we have different wholesale accounts um, and where you can find our products all over uh, the United States and in Canada. Uh, we do have a few um, customers as well in Europe uh, and Japan. And so we, uh, we also have uh, 3P, so you can find us on Amazon, you can find us on Walmart Marketplace, uh, and on eBay as well. And, and who would your main customer be as an end user? Yeah, so I think for our paddle sports and camping line, uh, outdoors people, people that are looking to get in the paddle sports industry, whether you're a, a seasoned veteran in the paddle sports industry, or hey, somebody who's looking to just try out the, uh, you know, get a canoe and go and paddle around the water uh, for the first time, anyone who's looking to be out, outdoors, and, and uh, also people who really appreciate made in the USA companies and, and made in the USA products, um, because like I said, we, we will screech that from the highest mountaintop that we are made in the USA um, and, and we're very proud of that. And then, you know, to alter over to our industrial line, uh, customers would be people who have small businesses, small contractor construction companies that are have one truck, two trucks, three trucks that they're looking to outfit to where they can, can buy a set of racks for their pickup trucks. And then when they have the big expense of having to actually update and, and buy a new vehicle for their, uh, for their line, they can just swap 
racks onto a new vehicle instead of having to, to buy an entirely new rack because we know that's a big expense to big construction contract companies um, as well. So, um, you know, we have the two different lines there. So we kind of appease to do different markets um, uh, of customer base, but I would say those, those would sum it up. You talked uh, quite extensively about uh, your pride in making products in United States and and running a American manufacturing operation, what type of challenges go with trying to make products? So many things have been offshored in the last 25, 30 years. What kind of challenges are you up against by trying to make it here, uh, you know, and and uh, and manufacturing a, a great product here? Yeah, I think challenges just you know from from the standpoint of of I don't know if I would call it a challenge, but, you know, it's not a surprise. You can look at something that's, you know, this is pretty uh, common to know that, you know, if you see something that's offshore versus made in the States, the price point's going to be a little bit higher. Um, now we don't hide from that. That's not something that we're, we're trying to, to stray, away, uh, stray away from. We're a premium product and we're proud to say that we're a premium product. And so to compare us to something that can be made, you know, not in, that's made overseas, so to speak, that's offshore. Um, but I would say that would be kind of a, a challenge that would co- coincide with that. It's just a, a price point. Um, you know, people will see uh, a product with a little bit higher and the people who only look at the dollar figure standpoint versus the investment in the, the product that you're getting, because we, we do think that, you know, our products are an investment. Like I said, we don't shy away from the fact that, that our products might be a little bit more expensive than some out there, but you're investing in quality. You're investing in, in made in America. And as you know, with, with Duluth pack as well as um, you're not only investing in the product, you're investing in your family members, you're investing in your neighbors, you're investing in your friends, people that you're employing to work at made in, in America companies. Um, you know, you're investing in those people as well. So yes, you might be paying a little bit more from a price point standpoint, but you know that's going to to keep family family members employed. It's going to keep friends employed, neighbors employed, and so um, I guess I would say that's a challenge. Even though I don't consider it a challenge, I would say that would be a challenge. Grant, we are thank goodness coming out of something called COVID, where not only every business but every person has been affected by it. How has Spring Creek Manufacturing been affected by COVID? Yes, yeah, so uh, we were directly affected right away uh, where we actually had to shut down our um, production facilities and in, in all of our facilities uh, for six weeks. Um, and, and we had to lay everyone off, which was uh, extremely difficult. Um, and so that, that, that affected us uh, greatly right away. Um, COVID did. Um, but then when we were able to reopen and, and open our doors back up and get back to work um, in the spring of, of 2020, um, we actually, and, and I say this, uh, you know, with because COVID has affected so many people, we say this, it has benefited our company um, for the better from the standpoint of uh, that a lot of people have gotten involved with the outdoor industry when restaurants were closed, when movie theaters were closed, when, um, you know, different local facilities were closed where people would go to hang out. Um, They had to look for alternative ways to uh, have fun and get outside and get out of their house. And so how people did that was by getting in the outdoors, whether that was camping, whether that was hiking, whether that was being on the water and that fit right into Spring Creek. And um, we actually had a significant amount of growth through COVID. Um, now we think we we did do a little bit of shifting to where we put a lot of focus on our e-com platforms because we knew when people were at home, they were shopping online, they were doing a lot of that. And so we really invested in um, making sure that we were focusing on growing our e-commerce platform, our website and in different 3P platforms online. And, and so that really helped us there. Um, so I would say, you know, we were affected in a lot of different ways, um, you know, up right, right away at first being shut down, but then as the paddle sports camping and outdoor line uh, saw, or outdoor industries, excuse me, saw uh, somewhat of a boom, which I'm sure you can relate to as well. Um, you know, it, it kind of 
went crazy for us from from a busy standpoint. We got really busy and and we're growing through it as well. And we actually um, hired hired more people uh, through COVID, which was a great thing as well. Um, so it was it was something that uh, that was was challenging, but but uh, we think uh, we came out for the better. Grant, you said that you you know uh, obviously you were not an essential business. You. Uh, were forced to close down, thus lay off people. And so you weren't manufacturing for that six months, but yet people were buying because they were looking for other things. What were your challenges from an inventory, from a manufacturing standpoint, where people were buying all the way through it, but yet you weren't manufacturing from coming out of that six week time period of, of being shut down? Yeah, it was it was difficult. Um, I think, you know, we we did a really good job um, leading up to it where we had some some good stock of inventory, um, but then it was getting it built. And that's, you know, and then when it went and got real busy for us as well, it was a challenge. Um, but I think that's a testament to everybody at Spring Creek. You know, we we really kind of put our nose to the grindstone and and we got to work and, and we thought, you know what, we got to um, find a way to, to be able to um, make sure we could fulfill our customers orders and get the product to our customers that were wanting it. So um, again, that's a testament to everyone at Spring Creek. We worked really hard to build our inventory back up and, and make sure that we were, um, you know, able to fulfill orders for customers, but um, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but, but uh, we made it through it. Let's talk a little bit about the future of Spring Creek. From the standpoint, let's start with short-term goals. What are some of your plans that you have coming forward for Spring Creek? Yeah, so um, one thing that we're really focusing on right now for, is really growing our industrial line um, of products. You know, we we really, uh, I wouldn't say we're uh, we're just getting into that market, but we're really just uh, growing in that market right now. Like I said, we have had racks around for a while, different truck racks, but um, you know, we're listening to our customers on different products and accessories that we're developing every day, um, that we're prototyping, and and so I think growing that line is something that's that's really important to us, um, making sure that we can, can, you know, appease to our customers needs and maybe offer something to customers that, that isn't there on the market right now. And so, um, that I would say from a short-term standpoint, you know, we're really looking to grow that industrial, industrial line of products. And, and what are some of your long-term goals and visions for Spring Creek? Let's, let's look at this five and 10 year type plan. Where are you looking to go and take Spring Creek manufacturing? Yeah, absolutely. I think the um, first and foremost, you know, we want to grow. Uh, we want to grow the company to where we can uh, be hiring more people and employing more uh, more Americans and and getting more people to work as well. And I think that would be that would be goal number one for you know from a long term standpoint is being able to um, continue to hire hire more people um, so that we can get people to work and continue to to produce and, and manufacture these quality made in, made in America products. And um, that's something, you know, kind of going back to the uh, the COVID conversation is, you know, one thing that uh, we learned first and foremost through COVID is, or one thing that, that I learned uh, specifically is that, you know, we need to support one another and we need to support American made companies and American made products. Um, you know, I know myself personally, if I go to go to a store and, and I see two products standing next to them, sitting next to each other, and one has an American flag on it, and it was made in the USA, and one didn't, even if the, the price takes a little bit more for the one with the flag on it, I'm buying that one because I know that that that's that's supporting our neighbors, our friends, our family, um, and so we want to do more of that. We want to we want to continue to grow and 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 get people um, to work for Spring Creek and and, uh, and continue to go on that route. And um, the way that we're going, you know, we're 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 growing year over year. We've had a lot of success um, since taking over, um, you know, back in in 2017. And so you know, we want to continue on that that trajectory and on that path. And um, I don't I don't see that as, as something that we can't continue to do you've gotten some uh, some really nice press over the last couple of years number one as a american manufacturer but number two as as a turnaround of an american manufacturer uh can you tell us a little bit uh about forbes 
Yes, we were we were featured in uh, in Forbes uh, for manufacturing in the United States, made in the in the United States, and um, highlighted our our both of our, our our paddle sports product line and our industrial truck rack product line. And um, you know, when you hear the the you hear Forbes and, and, you know, being somebody that, that, you know, you hear that all the time. It's like, Oh my goodness, Forbes. And, and so it was super cool to, to get involved with that and have them feature an article on, on made in the USA. And we need more of that. I mean, we, we truly do. We need um, people to really uh, focus in and, and, and appreciate made in America companies. I know I probably sound like a broken record saying that so, so many times, but um, you know, it's something we're proud of it's, it is. And so for them to do that and to be, to be featured, have Spring Creek featured in Forbes um, in an article in Forbes, it was, it was pretty neat and pretty cool experience to, uh, for myself personally, to, to be interviewed for that. And um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Grant, before we, we move on to our next segment, can you, for our, uh, maybe educate our our listeners you talked a little bit about family business and folks uh grant and i are uh, father and son uh in business together uh at spring creek manufacturing uh i'm strictly an investor in the company grant does all of the heavy lifting and 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 runs the whole operation but for others that are possibly thinking getting into business with family members. What advice could you give them to the positives or the negatives? You hit on a little bit of it earlier on, but just more as, hey, you're in it five years now uh, with family, directly with family, and what advice and wisdom can you give? Yeah, first of all, don't sell yourself short. I've seen you up there on your days off running a lathe machine or running a, a mill or a drill press. So don't say that you don't do any heavy lifting. That's, that's not true. I've seen you, you run a miter machine pretty well. So um, anyway, uh, the first and foremost, uh, most important number one, I would say is definitely have open lines of communication, draw a line in the sand, what's home, what's business. And, and I think those are important absolutely important because um, one thing that you would hate to see happen is that a family relationship is ruined over business. Um, I'm sure there has been many situations where that has happened. Um, and so I think having that open dialogue and that open line of communication up front right away, hey, when we're at work, we're working. When we're at home, we're at home. And not to say that you can't have work conversations at home. That's not it. But it definitely needs to be a line drawn um, to know, you know, hey, you know, we're we're at home now or or we're at work now. And 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 so communication number one um, for sure. And and you know, the other one is is I think just have fun. Um, I know it's you know, we we often say, you and I often say this, you know, to each other or just, you know, to others, but, but, you know, we take our business very seriously, but, um, you know, but we're having fun what we do and we enjoy what we do every day. And, and so um, I think that's, that's another thing is, you know, do you don't get involved if you don't think it's going to be fun um, because that's, that's probably the utmost in, importance as well. So, um, you know, I know that's five years in now, I'm still having fun. Uh, I guess yeah, I'll let you answer that yourself. Um, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but um, yeah, I think, I think those would be two, two real important ones is have fun, but a definitely open line of communication. Um, you know, you can probably speak to that as well. Uh, but, but, you know, I know early on those, those were something that we really wanted to make sure was important. We, we did, folks. We, we drew a line in the sand. We had rules, very specific rules, um, so that we did not cross those lines and, and potentially damage family relationships. Uh, and that's very, very important. And, and as we always say, we take our business very seriously, but uh, we are not saving lives. We're building awesome Made in America products. We're not saving lives. Grant, we're going to go a little bit uh, personal on you here in our packed question segment so people can learn a little bit more about you. Outside of work, what is your favorite hobby? Uh, that's an easy one, uh, hunting. Um, and I'll delve into that because hunt saying hunting is probably a pretty broad answer. Um, 
I would say hunting as in the full spectrum of hunting. Um, and, you know, I'll say the conservation of hunting as well. I mean, I know you know this about me, but, um, you know, I think I probably get just as much, if not more enjoyment out of the conservation of, of hunting than I do the actual hunting uh, action of hunting. Um, I, I love to spend time outside, as I mentioned. Um, so, you know, I have, I could, I probably have enough trail cameras that could sink a battleship and I probably get more enjoyment out of putting trail cameras up and getting pictures of deer, not even just deer, but just animals. I mean, raccoons, uh, you know, coyotes, fox, timber wolves, uh, timber wolves and, and all the different uh, animals and wildlife out there. But just being able to see like, hey, you see a, a one year old deer on camera and and be able to watch it through, you know, as it grows. And and then the conservation standpoint of of cultivating the land and planting crops and and planting trees and and just being just activities outside. So I'll say hunting um, because I think I, I do a lot of, uh, you know, in my free time, I, I spend time thinking and planning on, on what's going to come for, for for the hunting season. Um, but, but I think, you know, just, just the whole aspect of conservation with, with hunting and being outside and outdoors, basically, you know, fishing, camping, things like that. But I would say, uh, most important, most, my favorite hobby, excuse me, would be, would be hunting. I think you put more time and energy into pre and post season than you actually do season, Grant. Oh, no, no doubt. Absolutely. No doubt. What is your best vacation spot? Uh, Hawaii. Not even, not even a comparison. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be to Hawaii twice now. Um, and I will be back a third time and hopefully a fourth time. And it is uh, easily my favorite spot to be on vacation. Um, the term relaxation goes so much further when you're in Hawaii. And uh, it's just if those who haven't been uh, get out because it's relaxation on steroids. And it is uh, I'd say Hawaii by by far Hawaii. Well, next time you go, you can take me. Yeah, sound, sounds good. I'll make sure I leave a spot in my suitcase for you. There you go. Uh, what is your favorite band or musician? So this is going to be kind of a surprise because I'm I'm a big uh, I'm a big music buff actually I, I like all kinds of music um, not a fan of country personally uh, but but I pretty much like all fans of music or all types of music but I would say uh, the band Def Leppard uh, has to be my favorite my favorite music group. Um, I know that's a little oldies, uh, for my time, but, um, it's, uh, I couldn't find a song of theirs that I don't like. Fortunately enough, you and I went down to a concert at the XL a couple years ago. And, um, I, I pretty sure when the song rock of ages came on, uh, you couldn't even hear yourself think. So I'd have to say Def Leppard is my favorite, favorite music group or band. Yeah. I think that maybe that's one of the reasons that I wear hearing aids now is, uh, is that concert as well as a, a few others. Yeah, I'm probably not far behind you. Uh, Grant, what is your biggest fear? Because I have yet to see it because you've been absolutely fearless. I've watched you jump out of an airplane. I've watched you assert. I've lit literally watched you swim up towards sharks, not in a cage. Um, what is your biggest fear? Um, I would have to say, um, boy, there you go. See, I, I knew you were pretty fearless. That's a good question. No, no, I know. Uh, I, you know what? I think, uh, I'd have to say snakes. Um, that's probably one that I, like I see a snake and it sends uh, a shiver down my spine. Um, now if, you know, I, I could, if I got a hold of a snake, I'd probably, uh, uh, you know, play around with it a little bit, but I'd probably say a snake. I just think they're uh, unorthodox with their movements and uh, uh, you know, you never know which direction they're going. So I'll just throw it and say snake. And the last one is what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I just say work hard. Um, I think you can't put, I, I couldn't put a, a greater emphasis on, on having a work ethic. Um, you know, I think that was 
instilled in me as a young kid um, to, to work hard, no matter what it was, whether it was in sports, whether it was in a, at a job, no matter what job it was, professional, or even when I just was working my high school jobs, um, work hard, work harder than everybody else there. Um, you know, you, you <laughs> You can't you can't pick how smart you or intelligent you are. Uh, you know that's that's something that uh, I can tell you right now that there are a lot of people on this earth that are smarter than I am. Um, but I would confidently say that not a lot work harder than I do. Um, and so I think that's just been instilled in me since since I was a kid is is to work hard and um, no matter what what it is that you do, whether like I said, whether it's sports or in professional career. Um, just be willing to roll up your sleeves and work because uh, you're going to find that, that a lot of, a lot of doors open for you. And, and, you know, you find a lot of um, successes that follow hard work and having a work ethic because uh, you know, uh, talent can only take you so far and smarts can only take you so far. And uh, you know, there's nothing, nothing that can substitute good old hard work ethic. So I'd say hard work, create your own luck through hard work. huh? That's that's true. So yeah, work, I'd say uh, work hard and have a work ethic would be the best piece of advice or best uh, fundamental thing that was instilled in me. Folks, our special guest today has been Grant Sega, the vice president and partner in Spring Creek Manufacturing. Grant, can you give us the handles to the business once again? Yes, absolutely. So website, you can find us on the web at www.springcreek. Dot com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Spring Creek, S-P-R-I-N-G-C-R-E-E-K-M-F-G, Spring Creek, M-F-G. Grant, thank you so much for being here today. We learned a lot from you, a lot about Spring Creek and, and a lot on how to run a company and how to run a family business. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Folks, and until next time, unplug from the indoors. And as Grant Sega says, recharge in the outdoors.